Good morning. It's 8.30 on Wednesday, November 30th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, multiple tornadoes swept through parts of the state yesterday. We get an early assessment from the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. Then the federal government orders the city of Jackson to give up control of its water system. Plus, a central Mississippi clinic provides an update to the state's rate kit. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The National Weather Service in Jackson is planning multiple area surveys today following severe weather that passed through Mississippi yesterday. Tornado sightings have been reported. They touched down in Lowndes and Simpson counties and other communities across the state are facing down trees and some structural damages. Mallory White is Director of External Affairs with Mississippi Emergency Management, and she joins us with an update on yesterday's weather event. Now, Mallory, I know it's early and there's still a lot to look at and assess, but what can you tell us about damages at this point? Yes, good morning, and thanks for having me on today. So, yes, currently we have five counties reporting some type of damage at this time, and I'll list them for you, Prentice, Choctaw, Lowndes, Monroe, and Jasper. So that's mostly central and then up north counties. Those are the ones reporting it right now. Um, A lot of it, like you said, structural damage, um, homes, uh, seeing some type of damage. In Lowndes County, it got pretty bad for them. Um, There were several people who were entrapped in their homes. Um, for a period of time, we cannot thank the first responders in the county EMA for everything that they've done. And today it's boots on the ground. It's those uh, official damage assessments that will be happening. Um, the American Red Cross is on the ground up there assisting them as well. And once we get these damage reports in and see just how extensive it is, um, we'll wait to see if the county is asking for any additional resources. We're here to, to help. Do you happen to know at this point if anyone has been displaced as a result of severe weather? I don't have an official number on anyone displaced at this time. Um, I know that our team is working with the American Red Cross to identify those right now. Um, We have to get uh, a little bit more um, information on that as the day goes on just to make sure. Um, One of these things that we'll be doing now is we will be counting how many homes were impacted, how many people are insured or uninsured, those types of things. All of these things factor in um, into possibly getting federal assistance. I know that's a big question a lot of people ask after a storm, but we've got to set some expectations. Sometimes it does not happen very quickly. And with this one being so widespread and the damage is so widespread, it's going to take us a little while to get those damage assessments validated. But if anyone has any immediate needs right now, we do encourage them to contact their local emergency management agency. As you said, the storm was widespread, and there were a number of waves of severe weather that came across the state, but there were pockets that were missed. Do you happen to know some of the pockets that avoided any damage at all, any severe weather? I don't really have that information. I know, you know, Following the weather last night, there were at times where we had multiple tornado warnings um, throughout the state. One was up north, one was down south. Um, I don't think anyone really um, was spared from anything. Uh, the tornado warnings that we received were pretty pretty widespread across okay. the state and took down power. Um, I think the peak number of power outages we received was about 12,000. And as of right now, that's at 6,205. And so um, great work to those linemen who are out there working to restore the power for folks, because I know it's a little chilly today and that can be uncomfortable as well. Yes. And shelters opened as well to uh, give people a safe place to stay. Is that something that is going to um, be closed today? Will they be able to get in there if they had damage to their homes? That will be a call on the county. So each county will make that call. Um, a lot of people think that the state controls those safe rooms, but we don't. They're owned and operated on the county level. So each county will, um, after doing their assessment, see if there is a need to keep those shelters open. Mm-hmm. 
What can people do if they have damage? I know that there is a tool that they can use on your website. Can they also call? Um, what's the best way to report damage? The best way to report damage is going to our website, msema.org, and at the top you're going to see a self-report tool. Um, you need to click the county uh, where you live in and fill out the form accordingly. Uh, residents can do this and business owners as well. Um, and this helps us as well as your local EMA directors get a, a better picture of just how widespread this damage is in that specific county. So we do encourage them to do that. If they don't have access to do that online, we do encourage them to report any damage to their local emergency management agency as well. Um, and, and this is for information gathering. We want people to understand that this is not an application for assistance, but this helps us get a much quicker look at the damage. Is there anything, any other information that you can share with us at this point? So one thing I, I want people to, to know is not all, it's not all lost. If for some reason we, we don't meet a threshold for any type of federal assistance and things like that, there are a lot of counties through our state that have long-term recovery committees. And these long-term recovery committees can um, use state uh, disaster assistance repair money um, for building materials only. And these long-term recovery committees go in and they help repair these homes. Um, it is for those who are not insured. And... Um, We've helped a number of people and these counties, these long-term recovery committees, have helped a lot of people um, get back to normalcy. And so I would inquire if you live in a county and you're not sure if there is a long-term recovery committee in your area, I would inquire about that and see if that is an option. All right. Mallory White, Director of External Affairs with MEMA, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us and giving us an update on the severe weather results. And more Thank will you. be we'll coming out, more. I'm sure. Yes, and we will have more. We'll have much more information um, throughout the day. We get roll-ups um, periodically throughout the day. And so I'm hoping to get better, you know, more clear numbers. And we'll put that out as soon as we get something more definitive. Thank you so much, Mallory. We appreciate your time. Thanks. Coming up, the federal government orders the city of Jackson to give up control of its water system. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. The U.S. Justice Department is making a rare intervention to try to bring improvements to the beleaguered water system in Jackson. The department filed a proposal yesterday to appoint a third-party manager. This comes months after Governor Tate Reeves issued a state of emergency and put operation of the treatment facilities under state control. The DOJ proposal is an interim measure while the federal government the city of Jackson, and the Mississippi Department of Health try to negotiate a consent decree to achieve long-term sustainability of the water system. The city must also maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act and other relevant laws. State Senator John Horn lives in Jackson. He tells our Kobe Vance this provides a path forward to fixing the water system. I think that we've had some constructive involvement um, by uh, all parties concerned, the city, the state, especially the Department of uh, Public Health and um, uh, the um, leadership in the state, I think, has, has done a, a fairly decent job, uh, even though we've had a lot of rancor between the mayor and the governor. Uh, but they've done a, a decent job of trying to get us to a solution. Uh, and I think this is probably the best path forward. We have situations where the, the city did not uh, have confidence in the state taking over its system because they didn't think that, that they'd ever get it back if the state did take it over. The state had, had questions about the city's ability to manage its own system. 
And uh, the, the best possible remedy uh, is to have the EPA step in and provide a third-party administrator, at least in the short term, for a, a year or so uh, to get us t- towards a long-term fix. I hesitate to completely call this privatization of the city's water infrastructure because the city maintains ownership and overall oversight of the water treatment plants. But primarily under this proposed stipulated order, the city would be handing over pretty much all control of uh, of the water treatment plant to a private entity. The mayor's raised his concerns. What are your thoughts? I think that there's no question that Regardless of the path that we took, it would involve a third-party administrator. Uh, TPAs are nothing strange or unusual. A lot of cities have third-party administrators who manage and operate uh, a lot of their infrastructure programs, including uh, drinking water as well as wastewater. Uh, and so uh, this is this is not something that's um, that one would consider strenuous or out of out of out of uh, the ordinary. It happens every day, uh, and I, I don't know what the question was about a third-party administrator that would include privatization. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that, that folks are mixing up different terms. What we're talking about is someone who, who uh, in this case, would answer to EPA as the lead dog in, in this matter, but. Um, uh, a third-party administrator is it, really required at this point. I wanted to get your feedback on what it's been like living in Jackson yourself. Um, what are you hearing from your constituents about the city's water? I, I think the average citizen has about had it with the city's water crisis issues that manifest themselves in different ways depending on, on the week or the month. And the average citizen, the average rate payer, doesn't care who manages the system so long as it's managed well. Uh, They want to be able to to go to a faucet and clean drinking water comes out, and they want to be able to to go to a toilet and flush it, and the refuse goes where it needs to go. And they want to be able to get a bill that's reliable and that's accurate. So we we have um, uh, come up with a potential long-term solution for two items on that three-legged stool, uh, where the, the order doesn't um, carry forth, in my opinion, uh, as far as I would have liked it, is, is the operation of the wastewater uh, treatment facilities, uh, also a part of this, the Water Sewer Administration for the city. So, so you know, I, I describe it as a three-legged stool. you, you got to have drinking water, you got to have wastewater treatment, and you have to have billing and, and collections. So two legs of this, this three-legged stool are, are being addressed in this order, which I can understand is, is mostly about Safe Drinking Water Act. And, and so the, the, the focus is on safe drinking water and the billing and collections. But at some point, we've got to get to that third leg on, on that three-legged stool, which is the wastewater. Further down the line, the city is looking to potentially be under a consent decree um, by the federal government to making long-term investments in this water infrastructure. Do you think that this temporary solution for ensuring somebody's taking care of the city's water is going to be able to fill that gap until that long-term solution is found? Yes, well, you know, we're under a consent decree for both our drinking water and our wastewater. Uh, This action by the Department of Justice and the federal courts, along with EPA, is going to uh, help us to very tangibly address the drinking water system and get the the consent decree uh, resolved with the drinking water. But we still have the the consent decree on the, the wastewater and uh, that solution is, is not in sight at this, this point, but I think that this latest order, uh, once it's, it's approved by the courts, will uh, put us in a, a, a much better position to get to a long-term solution, at least on our drinking water and our billing and collections. Hopefully, at some point, we'll include the wastewater issues as well. The, the big issue for me at this point is how are we going to pay for it? The city's broke. It doesn't have the means of personnel nor expertise to manage its own system so a third party administrator makes all the sense in the world but but uh, the big question is how are we going to pay for it 
And I think putting a, a third party administrator who's got relationships at the federal level will help us to identify those federal resources that are going to be so much needed to get get us to a long term solution on this. Do you think there's any state resources that could also help? Oh, yes, there's definitely a role the state of Mississippi uh, should and could play uh, in the long term solution for the, the, the city and its water crises. Um, and we're hoping that um, we'll get some friendly um, years that will be listening in, in, amongst our colleagues and the leadership of, of the state to make a commitment for our capital city. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kobe. That's our Kobe Vance with Senator John Horn of Jackson. City officials and the State Department of Health declined to comment on the DOJ proposal. In a statement, Governor Tate Reeves says this is excellent news for Jackson, describing the water system as a crisis of incompetence. Coming up, a Central Mississippi Clinic updates the state's rape kit. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. A forensic clinic in Mississippi has revealed the first update to the state's rape kit in 15 years. The updates to the forensic examination are done by a committee made up of sexual assault nurse examiners and law enforcement personnel. Nurse practitioner Beth McCord led that committee and shares more on the changes with our Lacey Alexander. The most important changes we feel is uh, changes to the documentation Um, so that it's a little bit easier to understand um, which forms to use and then also that we were able to remove the steps that were the most uncomfortable to patients which is um, the pulled body hairs. Gotcha. So this is a lot about um, making sure this test isn't maybe as invasive as the previous one? It's still invasive because we are having to look at their whole body and sometimes we're asking them to do what their abuser asked them to do. But we feel like that we took a lot of thought into removing some things that was not evidence-based and was not the most up-to-date protocols and procedures so that they are not... um, they don't feel that uncomfortable when they're having the exam done. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you don't have to get too explicit, but about the process of issuing one of these kits? You talked a lot about consent. You talked a lot about how consent is different for different age groups. Um, talk to me about how these kits are offered at first and then administered and then given. Just talk to me about that process of how it gets from your hands to the law enforcement's hands. Okay. So <clears throat> every saying has... Um, you know, a different way that they that they conduct a business. But the way that I do is I go in and I sit down with my patient and I just talk to them about what their options are and I make sure that they make the decision. I want them to be, um, I want them to feel enabled to make their own informed decision on what they want done to their body. And so I talk to them about having the samples collected. And then I also tell them if if sample collection is not what they want, then they can have the same head-to-toe physical exam um, with the same lab work and the same prophylactic medications for adult clients, even if they don't want the samples collected. I also educate them that if they do have the samples collected, I then talk about the process. Once these samples collected, regardless if you want to report to police or not, they are given to police um, to maintain chain of custody and for them to store it. And I talk to them about their rights and making sure that they know they've got, you know, 72 hours to report the crime. And they can take that time to sleep and um, and get something to eat or whatever they need to do before they make that decision. 
And so then they would call law enforcement and say, okay, I want to report, and, and the law enforcement would already have their kit. So that's the way that I do it is I go in and I make sure that they understand their options and then that they make an informed decision, not based off of my opinion or the advocate's opinion, but based off of what they want done. I make sure that they understand that they have control of that room and their body at that moment. The Bridge Forensic Clinic led the development of the new rape kit. The clinic was opened by the Center for Violence Prevention in 2018 and employs three sexual assault nurse examiners, or what's referred to, or they are referred to as SANES. Sandy Middleton is the executive director of the center. Everything we do at the center is client-based. What do our clients need? How can we best serve them? And for so many of our clients, justice is a big part of their recovery. They want to see justice. They want to see their offenders punished for what happened to them. And so this process is just a piece of our client-based services that we can provide for them. Um, obviously, there's a much better chance that justice will be served if they the appropriate DNA evidence is found and then our prosecutors and DAs can move on with the case. So, um, you know, and, and just the whole effort with the SANES and providing the SANES in the hospital, which is a service of, of our agency, all of that is, is just at the forefront of our goal, which is just to provide the, the finest evidence-based trauma-informed services for any victim that we see. Beth talked a little bit at the podium about how a lot of sane perspective went into the update of this kit. Why is it important to have input from those nurses when updating or creating stuff like this? Well, SANES are the ones seeing the clients. SANES are the ones at the ER in the middle of the night. SANES are the ones at the Bridge Forensic Clinic on Christmas Day. And they are the ones who are providing this immediate emergent care for these victims. And so obviously their input means everything. Uh, I'm not a SANE myself, but I've, I've been privileged to serve as an advocate for in multiple cases with these with these wonderful saying nurses and to watch them take care of these victims and to watch them value a client's trauma and and respect their what they've been through and then to show such respect for their bodies and the process it's just a blessing to see what SANES bring to victims of sexual violence. So, so the SANES are everything when it comes to victims of sexual violence. Experts say while the updated rape kits will be more mindful of victims' needs, the results are not expected to change. The Bridge Forensic Clinic is hoping the kit will begin circulating in the state in January. This 